Do you want a weekly dose of energy and marketing tips to grow your business? Then you've come to the right place. Welcome to The Lisa Pizik Show, a podcast that empowers entrepreneurs to heal and be heard, the permission to pivot, and the tools to design a life you love. Hello, hello, and welcome to the latest episode of The Lisa Pizik Show. Oh, I'm so excited to dive into my favorite mindset of an entrepreneur, of a startup. No matter where you are in business, I find that mindset is the piece that unites us all together. And I know there is no shortage of mindset information when you Google it on social media, but I'm excited that we have an expert here today who has done so many different things in the online world or just the business world, online, offline, TV, television, games. Oh my gosh, I can't wait to tell you about my guest today. And to really um, zone in, like to sharpen, to sharpen, you know, every time you hear something, even if you've heard it before, you hear a new perspective or you're in a different place. This past year, two years has been crazy, right? You're in a different place in your business, in your life. So you hear something or it lands differently. So I'm so excited today to dive in. And he wrote a book all about what we're talking about today. My guest, Captain Steve Hoffman. Steve, welcome to the podcast. Fantastic to be here. Oh my goodness. I'm so excited. So let me tell you about him. So Captain Hoff is the captain and CEO of Founderspace, one of the world's leading startup accelerators. And Founderspace was ranked number one incubator for overseas startups by Forbes and Entrepreneur Magazine. Now he is a venture investor, serial entrepreneur, author of several award-winning books, Make Elephants Fly, Surviving, Surviving, we're going to talk about that, Surviving a Startup, The Five Forces, and a founder and chairman of the Producers Guild Silicon Valley chapter, served as a board of governors of the New Media Council, and was a founding member of the Academy of Television's Interactive Media Group. So while in Hollywood, you worked for Fry's Entertainment, known for producing over 100 TV shows acquired by MGM, and your own venture-funded startup, Spider Dance, which produced interactive TV shows with NBC, MTV, Turner, Warner Brothers, History Channel, Game Show Network, I mean, come on. And then the games in Silicon Valley, you founded two more venture-backed startups, Games and Entertainment, that produce the games such as Tetris, Wheel of Fortune, Tomb Raider, right? X-Files, all these things that we know. And you've earned your bachelor's degree in computer engineering from the University of California, a master's in film and television from the University of Southern California, currently living in San Francisco, but spends most of your time in the air visiting startups, investors, and innovators all over the world. And I love that you train, you you train people how to think and the skill set and the mindset, which is so needed. Because I always tell people, if you're hitting a block or you're saying that this is hard, which we've all said at one time or another, you don't need another strategy. You need to fix what's up here in your mind and you need to go back to that. So tell us why your book, Surviving a Startup, Why did you name it that? And how did you get into writing that book and doing all the amazing coaching and and teaching and things that you do? I named it that because I've done three venture funded startups and two bootstrap startups, and they were incredibly hard. And now running Founderspace, which is a global startup incubator and accelerator, I work with hundreds of entrepreneurs every year all over the world. And I see their problems, like what they're smacking their heads against, what causes them to actually freeze up, what the things that impact their business the most and how they deal with those. Like you said, mindset, like how do they overcome those problems? I will tell you, the majority of startups out there, the majority fail. So the odds are stacked against you. If you're going to be an entrepreneur, it's going to be hard. 
But, you know, everything in life is hard. You know, if you want to be at the top at your job and you're in a corporate job, you, you have to push and struggle. You know, if you want to raise a family, if you want relationships, those can be very hard. You have to put a lot into them. So being an entrepreneur myself and helping, coaching, mentoring so many entrepreneurs, I see the mistakes they make, you know, when they go down a wrong path and when they refuse to change and they go off that cliff. Mm, yeah, I love how it's like, let's just debunk this thing and just throw it out there. It's going to be hard as in anything that we do in life requires work, requires sweat, requires love, requires hustle, requires rest when that time happens. Like this is a journey. And I think people forget that, that probably anything huge you've achieved in your life has taken time. It's, it's been a journey. And I love how you said, you know, exactly kind of the mistakes they're going to make, or what would you say is the number one thing that trips up people in business? I will tell you, it's something most people do not think about. Well, there is a myth out there that the harder you try, the more passionate you are and the more, mm. and you never give up and you stick with the same idea, you will eventually succeed. Mm. Well, that couldn't be further from the truth. Yeah. Honestly, it doesn't matter how passionate you are. It doesn't matter how many hours you put in working. It, it doesn't matter uh, whether you believe in your idea and stick with it to the very end, none of those things matter if you're going the wrong direction mm. because you are going the wrong direction. You are working on something where potentially there isn't a big market, where, where the customers don't really care or yeah. even exist for your product. So yeah. there's so many entrepreneurs. I see more startups die because the entrepreneurs have this mindset that I can't change. I have to stick with this. I, my idea is brilliant or I can't fail. I don't want to fail. So I don't want to say this idea is bad and change course because then I'm a failure and they stick with it and that ends up killing them. Ah, uh, I love that because, you know, we do hear that just hustle more or, or put, throw more money at it. And we're always like, oh no, that is bad advice. Um, and just because it works that way for someone else, like you said, doesn't mean that that's going to work for you. So I love that, that, that you're saying that inflexibility could be the death of you because you're, Thanks. you're, you're so tied on. This is the way it had to be really great entrepreneurs. And I've seen a lot out there, really great entrepreneurs. Don't stick with an idea that isn't working very long. Yes. They literally catch it early. They're like, they, they, they're op they don't put on those blinders that say, wow, I'm going to make this succeed no matter what. As soon as you say that, you're trapping yourself no matter what. Well, what if there isn't a market there? You can believe you'll make it succeed, but it will never succeed. Really smart entrepreneurs have the mindset, if my idea doesn't work, my idea isn't me. I am not a failure if this idea fails. So I can just jettison that. Like if you associate, if you have the wrong mindset and you associate yourself with your idea, then you're in trouble from the start. Mm -hmm. It is not you. So I have a term, like I write about in the book, kill your baby. A lot of times you have to kill your baby. This idea, you gave birth to it. You <laughs> love it. You want to see, you want to sell it to the world. You want everybody to love it too. But honestly, sometimes other people, it, it isn't the right idea and you have to kill it. So really good entrepreneurs are ones who actually keep an open mind to at any time. In, in fact, their job, when they come up with an idea, when you are starting your company, whatever it is, it could even be a project in a corporation, right? You're starting this project in this corporation. It doesn't have to be a startup. Whatever project you're starting, you, when information starts to come to you that it isn't working, you don't discard it. Like a lot of us just, mm. you know, we have our biases built in, right? We yeah. want to believe this is true. So we won't hear the, the negative information, but all information is really important. You cannot put those filters on. Mm. Number two, the, uh, another very important thing. When you are working on this idea, you have to be able to prove it doesn't work. 
So many entrepreneurs think their job is to prove the, their idea works. Well, that's not your job, right? Your job isn't to prove to the world that you have the greatest idea in the world, it, it, you know, that ever existed, that this is going to be the next unicorn, that this is going to make everybody <laughs> rich. That is not your job. Your job is quickly to go out into the world and find out if it doesn't work. Because if it doesn't work, you be, you, you got to get a new idea right away. <laughs> You're wasting your time. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of energy and a lot of money and a lot of heartbreak and all and, of that. And if you feel like Sisyphus, you're pushing this boulder up a hill because anything that doesn't work is really, really hard. <laughs> if, it's, yeah. if it's working, it just, it, the boulder is rolling and you can't keep up with it. But if it isn't working, you keep pushing it up and it comes back down. You push it up and it comes back down. Honestly, if you find yourself doing that in whatever you're doing, your career, your job, entrepreneurship, whatever you're doing, if you get that feeling, tell yourself, hey, maybe this isn't working. Maybe I have to totally ditch it and try something else. Yeah, I call it my term for that. I call it portable roots. You have to be willing to let those roots be portable. Like you said, okay, I thought it was going to go like this, but the data is telling me, uh uh, I still have a skill set. I still have talents. I like, I think that's one of the beautiful things too about being an entrepreneur and a creator is we have no shortage of ideas, or, you know, sometimes the squirrel brain is you have too many. But I love that thought of don't get tied to the outcome. Don't get married to that outcome. Like you said, kill your baby. It's true, right? There will always be another baby as long as you don't quit. But don't yes. be tied. Yeah. Because that outcome is only in your head until it exists in reality. And a lot of us can fool ourselves. Like we, we really, you know, we can believe anything if we let ourselves. So what we have to do, I tell entrepreneurs, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, this is the mindset you need to have. Your job is not to make to prove that you are brilliant, that you have the best ideas in the world. In fact, the most successful entrepreneurs in the world, they usually didn't come up with it, the ideas. Everybody calls them a genius, but what they did was actually recognize the ideas of other people and take them to fulfillment. Mm -hmm. They didn't come up with them. Now, let me give you some examples if you don't believe me. So Elon Musk, we all say he's a genius. He didn't start Tesla. Tesla was a company started by other entrepreneurs that he was an investor in. He took over Tesla from them. They're actually mad at him because he took all of the credit, but he deserves a lot of the credit because he is the one who took this idea and made it real, but he didn't start it. Mm. Everybody knows Steve Jobs out there. Well, St all of Steve Jobs' great ideas, he didn't come up with originally himself. The idea for the Macintosh, you know, that brilliant user interface was developed by Xerox. The idea for the iPod, there were tons of MP3 players out there before the iPod. He made it much better and brought it to market at just the right time in just the right way. You got to give him credit. Like he's a genius, but he didn't come up with these ideas. He made them better. On and on and on. You look at these great entrepreneurs. When you're out there, don't expect yourself to come up, like have this epiphany that will drive you to success. If you do that, you're doomed. Your job, actually, your number one job as an entrepreneur is not to come up with ideas. It is to go into the world and hunt for demand. Like mm -hmm. I, and this is something people don't realize. They think, oh, I got to come up with that brilliant idea, you know, or I won't be successful. No, pick an area you're really passionate about, pick an area you're really interested in, and you think you can add a lot of value. Bring together the other people you need to actually execute on that because execution is really hard. Like most startups fail because uh, you know, like it's a solopreneur and they're trying to do something really complex that they can't do alone, yet they refuse to get the right people on board early. So you have that. And then as a team, go into the world without any ideas, with a lot, you know, you have a lot of assumptions of what people might want. You go into the world and you start figuring out, wow, there are people out there because the world is always changing. Markets are changing. Technologies are evolving. You know, nothing is static. There's always opportunities. That's what we have to remember. There are a gazillion opportunities out there waiting to be discovered. And the ones who become, you know, hyper successful that you'll read about in the future are the ones who didn't come up with the ideas, but discovered the demand, the opportunity. Because demand, I will, you know, this is another fallacy that people have. They believe that we can create demand. We create a great product and then we create the demand. That never, ever, ever happens. Mm. No one creates demand. The demand is already there. You show people that this is possible and then 
boom, that demand explodes. Like they're, oh my God, like you can do that. I want that. And they all start coming to you because that demand was already there. Ah. So re really smart entrepreneurs, they say, where are people struggling? What are their pain points? Where are they going? Oh, I wish I could do this. I don't know how, but I really, you know, that would save so much time. That would make my, you know, that would make life easier. That would make me more money. Whatever goals they want to accomplish, even entertainment, like, wow, that would be really amazing if that existed. They might not even be able to articulate it, but when they see it, they're all over it. If you can find that pent up demand that no other company is serving, you have an opportunity to grow extremely fast. And those are the entrepreneurs we read about that become unicorns. Oh, okay. I love this so much because what was coming up for me, I wrote really big on my paper, hunt for demand, because so many times you hear the advice, go hunt for the clients, hunt for the clients, sales, sales training, uh, 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 right? Pain point marketing, hit them harder. No, like you said, what is that thing that people need? It, it requires listening. It requires getting out there. It requires something completely outside of you. Again, like you said, we waste so much time or people waste so much time with, you know, is my idea good enough? And I got to prove that there's need. And it actually has nothing to do with you. It's about listening what people are saying, God, I wish somebody would just create, or I wish there was a thing that just did blah, blah, blah. And you go and you, you hunt for that to man. Oh my God. Yeah, I love and, that. And a lot of times people won't even be able to articulate it. Like if you go mm -hmm. to them, they, you, this is the type of listening you have to do. You can't expect them. Oh, somebody to come up and a customer and say, Oh, develop this product. Yeah. Me. They don't know. They're, they don't know. But right. what they do know is that they're having a problem that, th that this is taking, maybe this task is taking way too long. Like, you know, or that potentially they want to accomplish something right now that they can't accomplish. They wish, you know, they have these two things they want to communicate. They want to make it better, but they can't do it. People can tell you the outcome they want. Like they can tell yes. you what, what they, what the outcome is. And then your job as an entrepreneur, as an innovator is actually say, oh, they want this outcome. Wow. There's a new way to do this. Maybe mm -hmm. there's a new piece of technology. Maybe it's a new process. Maybe I can bring together people who can actually service them in a way that they aren't being serviced right now. 100%. Boom. I hit, I filled that demand. Hundred. I mean, that's essentially how our entire, my husband and I that run our company together. That's essentially how our entire company was formed was because of our process because people were saying, God, they're like, you're like three companies in one with the strategy and the content marketing, the digital marketing, and then the social, the lead generation. Like they're like, I got to find all these people. And then nobody knows my story. And then this, these people suck. And then why can't someone just come along and just take us through the process and do it all? And we're exactly. like, hi. Right. <laughs> and then when COVID hit, I know we're so tired of talking about COVID, but when COVID hit, they were like, oh my God, I'm so stressed. I'm so overwhelmed. I need help. My company is not going to survive if I don't get help and solutions. Ah, I'm going to them because they're timely. They're efficient. They're great at what they do. It's like, everyone's like, how did your business boom? Like, did you get some new sales prop? And we're like, we didn't sell anybody on anything. There was a demand for the way that we ran business and the process that we take people through and the end result. So we right. weren't hunting for clients. We weren't, we had a rock solid process that solved a whole lot of people's problems. And that's why people came to us. So I a hundred percent agree with every single thing you're saying. And that's such a killer mindset flip for people. Stop hunting for the clients. And you're right. People don't know when you ask them, what's this? They always say, survey your you, audience and tell them or ask them what they want you to create. They don't know, right? <laughs> yeah, they yeah. Don't, they're never going to tell you. They're going to tell you their problems. They're going to tell you their dreams. They're going to, you know, what they want to accomplish. They're going to tell you what matters to them. I yes. always tell entrepreneurs out there, you know, go to your clients and listen, what are your, what are the, you know, the top five things that, you know, that you really want to accomplish? or that are really driving you crazy. Ask those questions, write them down. If what you're offering isn't in the top three, not even the top five, like it isn't in the top three, they'll probably never call you back. Like, because honestly, all of us, like 
we are too busy. Like if something's, you know, five, six, seven down the line, we never get to it. Like it's it, because it, why would we? We're still trying to solve the top three. Like those Got are it. the things that are, are, are impeding our business, impeding our growth. So as an entrepreneur, you need to get out there and really start to get inside the head of your customer. Like who is your customer? You have to become them. Yeah. Then you start to see the world through their eyes. 100%. And this brings me back to the question that I have is my one peer and friend calls it a wantrepreneur. And I'm like, oh, I love that phrase. I don't love that because we don't want anybody to be entrepreneurs, right? But it just describes that, you know, we see Elon Musk and we see whether it's somebody like that or Steve Jobs. Or we see even just somebody we admire that that's achieved things or has things or is showing things on social media and people equate that this, you know, that's why, why is this so hard? Because they equate entrepreneurship with the jets and the boats and the house and the champagne and the, uh, you want, or the, the money to be able to start that charity or do that thing, whatever drives us. But not everybody, I don't, should everybody be an entrepreneur or you hear a lot of the, well, if you have an idea, just take it and run with it and you can make money with it. Like, should everybody be an entrepreneur? Yes or no? Well, the, the answer is absolutely no. Like, absolutely no. There, I have broken it down into different criteria that you can analyze yourself and find out, am I right to be an entrepreneur? Now, let me tell you, like, there's a lot of people who will make excellent scientists, incredible teachers, you know, wonderful corporate executives, but awful awful <laughs> entrepreneurs, like, they shouldn't, you know, and why would you torture yourself? Like, why would you do something that you, that you're not going to be happy at and you're not going to be good at, but so many people do because, you know, we, we read about it in the paper. It seems so romantic and, you know, all these people becoming billionaires or living their own lifestyle on beaches in Tahiti, whatever. Let me tell you all the reasons you should not become an entrepreneur. And then I'll tell you the reasons you should, the qualities you need to become an entrepreneur. I love it. So first of all, um, you should not become an entrepreneur if you hate your job. Like if you hate your job, that isn't a reason to go and become an entrepreneur. That's not a reason. Like it doesn't meet any of the criteria. If you hate your job, you should find a new job. <laughs> that would solve your problem. If yeah. you, sh you uh, shouldn't uh, be an entrepreneur because you want your freedom, you know, or you, or your boss is a tyrant. Like you don't want somebody hovering over you, you know, micromanaging you, doing all these things. Let me tell you, when you're an entrepreneur, I guarantee it, you will have a worse boss. You will have the worst boss you have ever had in your life because <laughs> that boss will be you and you will never be able to get away. It's not like you can go on a vacation. It's not like you can go home at night. You know, that boss will be in your head, in your bed every night talking to you. If you're on vacation, that boss will be nagging you. You should be working harder. No matter, on weekends, the boss will be after you. Like, you can never escape this boss. We are all our own worst bosses. So, honestly, you know, trying to escape another boss, like to have your freedom, <laughs> isn't the reason to become an entrepreneur. You know, other people just want to become an entrepreneur because they, they have the dream. They're going to be rich. You know, they're going to be famous. Again, that isn't a reason to become an entrepreneur. The reason to become an entrepreneur, and there's, there's one great reason. There's one great reason. It's because you, 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 you passionately want to bring something into the world to help other people. Now, yeah. I am not just to make you rich, not to do all these other things, to help other people. If you have that mindset, you will probably succeed because by having that mindset, help other people, what does that mean? That means going out into the world, looking at people who, you know, need help, right? <laughs> who are having problems and you figuring out how to help them solve their problems, create value for them, give them what they need. Those things define successful entrepreneurs. And it doesn't matter if you're a small business, medium-sized business, or giant corporation, the entrepreneurs who want to go out there and help people help the world make a real difference, they end up doing it. And they end up doing it by really focusing not on what's in their head, like I said, but what's in the world, the problems in the world that they see, and then piecing together all the pieces they need to actually solve those.
I love that. It's like that. I forget who said it or that quote I see where it said the world doesn't need more products. The world needs more solutions. The yes. world doesn't need more services. The world needs more solutions. <laughs> Don't go and just create another product to throw into the world. Exactly. Like you said, find the need and create the solution, find and the demand and create the solution. Absolutely. And then there's personality too. Like we all have different personalities. Yeah. Let me tell you, being an entrepreneur is stressful. Like there is almost no way around it. Now, some people handle stress really well. They're like, oh yeah, no problem. Other people just can't handle stress at all. If you're one of these people who cannot handle a lot of stress, well, you know, entrepreneurship will certainly up your stress level. So it might not oh, yeah. be a good life choice. Number two, um, if I'm somebody who doesn't like uncertainty, who isn't flexible, being an entrepreneur, things are crazy. They're changing all the time. Like, and you have to adapt. You have to change. You have to do these things. If you want everything rigid and structured, you know, every day, well, there are jobs out there where you can do it. Be a librarian, you know, be a computer <laughs> programmer. You know, there are jobs where you can have control over your environment and you can have consistency. Being an entrepreneur is not one of them. If, um, you know, if being an entrepreneur actually requires leadership, like the number one quality yes. that any entrepreneur must have, especially, you know, if you're a solopreneur, if you're doing something that you can do alone, you know, uh, by yourself, like writing a book, you know, just doing a podcast, you know, not growing a business or consulting, you can do that as a, a, without leadership ability. But as soon as you are required to bring in other people to make this actually work, then you are going to need that skill. And that skill is what, what I say, the, the CEO's role, a real CEO of a growing company, their role is not to do any of the jobs right. out there. Their role, job is to bring in all the right people and, all, and give them all the right resources. First thing you do, get those right people. Then you have to pay them, get the, you know, get the customers to pay them. Then you want to grow your business, go out, get the venture capital, get the media attention. You're always going out there, show, you know, great leaders have a vision. They show everybody, well, this is where we're headed. They have the ability to actually deeply understand other people. Like what are their, qual what are their qualifications? Mm -hmm. What are they good at? What role should I put them in? If they're not working, should I get rid of them? Like that's a tough, tough decision. The, you have to be that person if you want to lead the company. If you just want to join somebody else's company, and you could even be a co-founder in somebody else's company, but you don't have to be the CEO, then you don't necessarily have to have that strong leadership. You could spike in a certain area. Like there's co-founders who are really technical. There's co-founders who are great designers. You know, if you don't have some of the qualities I talked about, there's still roles for you in doing a startup, but you, you would be better off picking the role. Why wouldn't you have the best person you can possibly get as the CEO? That will maximize your chance of success. If you're not that person, go out and find that person yeah. and work with that person. Yeah, I love that. I think those are all the soft skills or maybe other skills in business or in entrepreneurship that people don't think about. Exactly like you said, how to lead your team, how to stay current and relevant. As you said, things are changing from the conversations we're having to the technology that we use to the innovative ideas that are out there and just the way the world is adapting. Great entrepreneurs are curious people. Yeah. They are always looking at what's coming, what's new and trying and trying it out. Like, you yeah. know, you aren't, if you're going to be an entrepreneur and you're the first one, you don't have to invent new technology. You know, we're not talking about that. You right. could be in a corporate job too, and be a very entrepreneur. You, if you want to get ahead in the world, you have to be doing things better than your competitor. So you can assume that all your competitors are doing a great job at everybody's figured out how to do it with the, the way things have been in the past. But how do you become better than them? That's to figure out how things will be done in the future, not the past. Mm. In the past, you're just like everybody else. How do, why would they choose you over somebody else? You're do, all doing it. This, you're all offering the same thing, doing it the same way. No, I'm going to go out there. I know there's all these new tools out there. There's new you know, applications. I don't have to invent these. I just have to bring them into my business and then figure out how I can benefit my customers. I was talking to an entrepreneur the other day and he was like, all my customers, you know, the competitor out there, the, the competitor explains everything to the customers, you know, what they're going to get, what service they're going to get, how it's going to work, blah, blah, blah. He goes, you know what I did? I took Google Docs, the spreadsheet application in Google Docs, 
And in, instead of just explaining it to them, I put it up there on the web, everything, all the steps we're going to do, all the information they need. And then I walk them through it. And from all the different partners I work with, we all plug into that. And they said, nobody's ever done this simple thing before. It's simple. Like they just took Google Sheets and actually <laughs> yeah. gave me the information I want. And they're all coming to that, that person for that one reason. It's just that extra step to show that you care or you're willing to do it different. Oh my gosh. Absolutely. Right. And to, and to actually go, you know, these tools are out there and yes. you don't have to invent. My point is you don't have to invent the tool. You don't have to invent yeah. Google Docs. You just have to figure out how to use it better than your competitors are. Like, yeah. And there's all these new tools being born. There's a, just new applications and stuff coming out. You got to be the one going out, trying these first, bringing them in. And if they offer real value and you offer them and none of the other guys are still doing stuff the old way, boom, you have a huge competitive advantage. Yeah, the way you, it's like that, don't recreate the wheel. If it's already there, use it. Just use well, it to its, yeah, maximum capacity. Right, because all it. this technology, yeah. imagine, if you had been one of the uh, first people, you know, you're selling, you own a retail store, but you're like, oh, I should allow people to take orders online. You know, why, if you were ahead of everybody else, it just makes it so much easier. It's a big differentiator. You're, you know, mobile, right? You, you should be one of the first people to get on these platforms, to try them out. There's a huge first mover advantage, even being on a social network. Like if you're marketing and you get on a new social network, you know, that's just taking off, you know, TikTok when it's just taking off and you start marketing yourself on that, you have a huge advantage to all the people that come later in building your brand. Yeah, totally, totally. I think the last question I have for you, and so this one might be a little bit out there, but I hear a lot of people asking about investors. So they're like, I got this idea, you know, I got this startup, I, you know, I want to get investors that are going to back us. And I think that there's this, this thought that all these people are just waiting around with money and they can't wait to give it to you for your amazing idea. And we always kind of chuckle and go, okay, well, you have to have certain things in place to get the eye of an investor, to get them to trust you. Like you have to have, you can't just have an idea and be like, oh, people are going to give me money and this is investor and this is entrepreneurship and yay. From being, now I believe you are an investor or you've helped, you've, you've, what are kind of the most simple, basic things that people have to start thinking about of having in place if they truly want to go after an investor for their startup? I write about this in surviving a startup in detail, like mm. real detail, like every single step and every, all the, you know, obstacles you'll face and exactly how to sell them, like how to sell them. Let me give you some footnotes here, like a, a, a really, a few pieces of the puzzle. First of all, um, when you, you know, if you have an idea that's not enough, let's face it, like invest, they call them venture capital. Either they're supposed to be adventurous, but let me tell you, nobody's adventurous. Nobody wants to lose their money. Like they are going to want you to prove to them that you have a real business. Now we all see some investors making bad decisions and funding companies that come to them with some crazy idea and they have no proof and it doesn't work out. Well, those investors don't keep their money for long. The successful investors, the smart ones, they are very careful about what they invest in. Before you go and raise money, you need to prove to yourself that this is a real business. So don't, I tell entrepreneurs, don't expect to raise money for the first year, honestly. Like if you, you, you may be able to, but if you're counting on it, you're probably going to be disappointed. Most entrepreneurs I see, they don't raise venture capital in the first year and they don't even go out and, you know, and if you get money from angels, it depends who they are. Some angels are just, they'll give money to anybody because they aren't very smart, right? They don't know what they're doing. <laughs> other, other angels are really, really careful, just like venture capitalists. Right. Um, I'm an investor, so I know I've sat on both sides of the table. I've done a lot of fundraising. This is what you need to do. So first of all, you need to go out there and get some data. Like, what does the world say? What, you know, can I really prove to these investors that this is a real business? It's not just an idea. Nobody invests in ideas, right? They invest in actual, they want to take and extrapolate from what you show them, the data you show them, like customers are responding this way. They are doing this. They want to extrapolate. Oh, this could be a big business. It's in a big market. They're right. You know, they have the right team. They're doing all these things right. Yes, I will invest. That's when they make this decision. Now, 
if you're talking to investors, if let's say you go out there, you find customers that really need your product, you identify that there are a lot of these customers out there, that it's a really big market, you, you actually maybe get some pre-orders, you know, you know, because you haven't built the product yet, you're very early stage, but you've got this huge pent up demand, right? You found that demand. Mm -hmm. That's what investors want to see. That's why you're a demand hunter. You go to them, look, I have the demand, I have the team. All you have to do is give us enough money to get this product to market. Then you get the early stage investors, the angel investors. You won't get the later stage, the, the real venture capitals, but you'll get the early stage ones. They will give you a hundred thousand dollars, 200, even $500,000 to kind of get this into the marketplace. Boom. If you were right, if you know, your data was right and everything was right, and there is that demand and you unlock it and things start going, real venture capitals come in. Real venture capitalists never fund people or they shouldn't be funding people experimenting with ideas. Right. That's for early angel stage. Real venture capitalists are meant to scale your business, grow it really fast. So once you've figured out it's working, this engine is making money, they're essentially advancing you money, like giving you money that you would make from your customers in advance so that you can go out and capture all these customers and then make a lot of money and pay them back. You know, that's their that's And their pay business. them back. Did everyone hear that? And they, I the think day, a lot of people think then, that they get it and it's, yeah, yeah. No, the day the investor invests money in you, they want it back. <laughs> right. And they want right. tenfold. Their job right. is to exit your company. Their right. job is, and if you, honestly, if you do, if you have a business that is linear growth, it can still be growing decently, but it's linear, not exponential. They don't, investors, most investors will not invest in you because they won't get their money back soon enough. Like linear growth takes a long time to get, you know, get enough money to get back. What they want is this thing going like crazy, because those are the things you read about that IPO that end up being acquired. The things that are just accelerating so fast because they've hit this huge pool of demand. They have the right team they're executing on. So venture capitalists are always looking at their exit, how they get their yes. money. Yes. Yeah, that. Oh, yes, yes, yes. That is exactly what I wanted for this piece. Because I think people are, what I've experienced is people are waiting on their ideas because they're waiting for the, the investors oh. to come in and then it's going to become a reality. No, no, no. It never becomes a reality when they come in. It's already a reality. Like the, I always tell entrepreneurs, if you're not famous, if you're not Bill Gates or Elon Musk or one of these people with you know great reputations and can get all the money in the world... Pick an idea that you can start on your own dime Thank with you. your own, with people that you can bring in who are willing to work for this equity, right? For the future of that company. Yes. Don't, don't pick an idea that's crazy that you're going to need a billion, you know, a hundred million dollars to get out the gate. Pick an idea that requires sweat equity. That's the best way. And mm -hmm. then you can start mm -hmm. to prove out the idea, grow the business and boom, if you hit it right, that's when you go and get investors. I love that. You said the data and the demand. If you can show the data and you can prove the demand. I love that. And that requires you taking that first step. That's where I see people saying, oh, I'm going to do that thing when I get this investor. And I'm like, the investors aren't coming, my friend. <laughs> like, if you want to do the thing, you need to do the thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I have a video on this, uh, a special video I'll give your audience for free. <gasps> so if they come to my website, founderspace.com, they can go to founderspace.com and there's a hidden site in there where you can get this video. It's called founderspace.com slash 10, T-E-N, mm. for the 10 commandments of venture capital. They go there, mm. they can put in the password, watch the video, and th that will take them through th all the different steps they need to understand. I love that. Steve, this was so incredible. Listeners, don't worry. If you're like driving the car right now and you don't got a pen and paper, I will make sure I put that video. I'll put that link to that video in the show notes. I will put, I believe your book, Surviving a Startup. We've referenced that several times. That would be a fantastic read. I want to make sure I have that in the show notes. Plus all of Steve, his bio, his Facebook, his Instagram, his LinkedIn, his WeChat, his Twitter, his email. I will have <laughs> all the ways they can find you on the interwebs and internets out there. And uh, thank you for giving us that video. I think that's a huge a huge piece. And you've answered all the questions that my audience has been asking me. And it's funny because I always joke where it's like one of those where like, you know, you say something to your child and they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the teacher says the same exact thing or the coach says the same exact thing. And you're like, that's what I've been 
saying. <laughs> like Lisa said it, but now because yes. you know, Captain Hawk said it, now they're going to truly listen. Now so, they'll listen, hopefully. Oh my God. I love it. So, so good. And I just love your energy. I love your personality. Oh, um, likewise. <laughs> no, I just love what you brought to this episode. Thank so thank you. you so much for being here with us today. And thank you for having me, Lisa. Amazing. And listeners, thank you for being here. Don't worry. Make sure I will take care of you. Don't worry. Make sure you go back to this. Um, grab all those notes that I'm going to put in the show notes, but come back to this when you're making decisions. I find that's a huge stage that we're in now. You know, we don't need any more. We don't, information is out there. You can find it everywhere. You're probably at a place where you got to make some decisions. And I really think this podcast helped us not only with the information and the mindset, but the decision making process. You've been listening to the Lisa Pizik Show. Let's connect more at www.lisapizik.com. And we'll see you next time on the Lisa Pizik Show.